Now I try to talk slow and loud, which I don't do well at either. But um, this title was actually off of a video that we're going to watch here this morning. And I think we've talked about transparency. And the video that has been produced this last year, 2016, I think it's the best video on, on commercial chicken production in the United States that's available. Uh, NCC has some things on their website. But we go through breeders, hatchery, and you'll see it here in a minute. And I think if folks would look at that video before they ask the question, the why would be evident, why we do these things. But um, So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then we're going to tell you. Uh, first, we're going to talk, watch this video. Then we're going to talk about we just don't do it in, in by ourselves. you already heard of the NCC. Uh, we work in conjunction with the NCC. But the auditors that we use, we want to have them know what they're talking about. And you all should know about the PACO, and we'll go a little bit into PACO. And then some things we've tried. We've been involved in uh, animal welfare research as a corporation primarily with the University of Georgia, Mississippi State, but we've been a part of NCC decisions also with PACO. Uh, Kate and I have gotten to know each other very well the last two years on working on PAWS. So we, we're part of that as well. And then I'm going to go through the last bit. There's five questions we just answered last week from one of our customers in the Northeast. Some of the hot topics that Kate already touched on. And I'll give you our answers, which I think are the good answers, but you all can judge that later. Uh, just as a baseline, I think this is worth reading, it's our first paragraph of our animal welfare policy. And it says, and I'll read it, Sanderson Farms believes the humane treatment of animals is a moral, ethical responsibility owed by every corporation holding assets and livestock. Because of this belief, the company is committed to setting and upholding the highest animal welfare standards in the poultry industry. All personnel who are involved with live poultry operations are expected to treat live poultry in a manner consistent with the company's animal welfare program. And like Molly, I think you can see everybody wants to say the same thing. We want to be the best. You know, and how do you define the best? Since 1955, Sanderson Farms has maintained the same hometown values of honesty, integrity, and innovation that were established by the Sanderson family more than six decades ago. At Sanderson Farms, we like to keep things the way nature intended meaning we don't add anything to our fresh chicken. No additives, no artificial ingredients, no preservatives. Our chicken consists of one single ingredient, 100% natural chicken. As the third largest poultry processor in the United States, Sanderson Farms is absolutely committed to the health and safety of our chickens. By operating our own feed mills, we maintain complete control over what our birds consume at every stage. We staff in-house veterinarians and nutritionists who ensure our corn and soy-based diets contain all the protein, energy, vitamin and mineral requirements necessary to grow healthy poultry. We do not use hormones or steroids in our chickens, which even if available, have been banned in the United States for more than 50 years. Our biosecurity procedures are focused on the safety of our chickens by limiting exposure to disease threats as much as possible. Viruses, bacteria, insects, wild animals, pets, and people all pose some risk, and that's why we limit visits to farms unless they're necessary for the well-being of the flock. Further, we advise all employees, growers, and visitors in live production to avoid contact with any other avian species. Owners and workers at farms cannot own or harbor any other bird species and are not allowed to visit any other poultry farms. Sanderson Farms must approve any visitor before they're allowed on any of our premises. Even Sanderson Farms personnel are considered visitors since they tend to visit more than one farm on a given day. Tires and undercarriages of visiting vehicles are sprayed at the farm gate prior to entry. We post a clearly visible biosecurity sign at each farm entrance. If non-farm personnel must enter chicken houses when birds are present, they're required to cover themselves with poultry protective equipment, not to protect the personnel, but to protect the chickens from any potential contaminants that could be brought in. All entrants are required to use disinfecting foot baths before entering any chicken house. All farm visitors, including Sanderson Farms employees, sign a visitor log providing ready documentation for veterinarians to trace effects of on-farm activity upon the health of the flock. Before entering in among the flock, farm owners, employees, and visitors must thoroughly wash their hands or cover them with disposable examination gloves. 
Sanderson Farm service technicians check the flock history recorded daily by the farmer. This includes water and feed consumption, mortality, any abnormalities, as well as temperature and brightness of the lighting. Technicians check to see that feed and water lines are charged appropriately and in good repair. They monitor the function of equipment controlling environmental temperature to ensure that it's appropriate for the time of year. Overall flock health is also assessed and any ill or injured birds are treated as necessary to maintain flock health. Any mortalities are removed for appropriate disposal. After use, all the poultry protective equipment stays on the farm to prevent anything being carried from one flock to another. Personnel also disinfect their shoe soles prior to entering company vehicles and their hands once inside the truck. Upon entering a breeder house, one sees that our birds live in a spacious house designed with reproduction in mind. Translucent curtains with special interior lights enhance sunlight, creating an internal spring for chickens and lengthening their reproductive life. Elevated surfaces provide a clean, uncrowded feeding area, while slatted floors keep feces and other debris away from the hens. Roosters are fed on a litter-covered floor to encourage them to stay down on the ground where their contribution typically takes place. Technicians routinely visit looking for good distribution of males and females, bird behavior, and any eggs that weren't laid in the nest. They also inspect nest boxes for hens that may have stayed in the nest too long. Hens prefer to lay eggs in quiet, dark, covered areas, so we provide nests for their comfort. In order to not disturb the egg-laying process and to make egg gathering more efficient, a belt out of the hen's sight moves the eggs from the nesting box to an egg gathering area several times a day. Eggs are collected from the belt outside the hen house, hand packed in flats and placed into farm racks for cooling. Cooling the eggs puts the embryo into true suspended animation so that when the eggs are warm to incubation temperatures they will develop into chicks precisely 21 days later. This entire setup mimics a hen's natural incubation process, and just as naturally, all the chicks hatch within hours of each other, even if the eggs are laid up to a week apart. Hatchery personnel pick up farm racks twice a week in refrigerated trucks and carry them to the cool egg room at the hatchery. Typically within one week of being laid, eggs are moved from farm racks into incubator setter racks and rocked for 18 days then transferred to a hatcher to finish out the 21 days of incubation. At Sanderson Farms, we take advantage of this transfer to vaccinate our future chicks against Merrick's disease and treat any bacterial contamination from the egg laying process. This single combined injection under the shell is the only time we inject antibiotics, leaving little opportunity for resistance to develop and no residues in the grown broilers weeks later when they go to market. Once an egg becomes a chick, it's removed from the hatch basket, selected for viability, and placed into a farm transport basket with its hatchmates. Any non-viable chicks or embryos are humanely euthanized by methods approved by the American Veterinary Medical Association. Through our animal welfare programs, hatcheries are audited at least twice a year by both internal and third-party auditors, assuring that hatchlings are handled in a safe and humane manner and that our growers receive only optimal chicks. While chicks are confined to transport boxes, we spray them with aerosolized vaccines. Stacked boxes of chicks are palletized and placed on specialized delivery trucks for safe delivery to their new home. Our broiler houses are specifically designed for the growth stage of life with wide open spaces ensure that birds are comfortable and safe while being provided unlimited access to plentiful supply of food and drink. Broiler house populations encourage maximal growth for the birds and optimal use of space for the contract farmer. With farmers typically carrying a 15-year loan on farms, each contractor is fully committed to long-term success in their growing operation. Technicians look at the well-being and distribution of birds and their behavior in general. Like youngsters of other species, chickens can be aggressive towards one another, especially in bright light. To reduce unacceptable behavior, Lights may be dimmed to create a more subdued environment and encourage more relaxed interactions. Once broilers reach the desired market size, they are hand caught, put into wire sided pens that are then loaded onto tractor trailers for a quick trip to the processing plant. This is the only time our chickens are ever caged, and here they are caged for their protection during transport. At no point are Sanderson Farms broilers ever injected with anything 
and there are never any antibiotic residues in our broilers when they go to market. By federal law, all chicken must be clear of antibiotics before they leave any farm. No chicken products sold in the U.S. contain antibiotics. Sanderson Farms is proud to have one of the highest livability ratios in live production of anyone in the industry. We are committed to providing the highest quality, 100% natural chicken for our satisfied customers. This is how we grow chickens at Sanderson Farms. So you jump back here. And I believe that video is actually going to be uploaded on the cloud. So it should be available to everybody if you have access through NIA. And we are very generous with that. We're not charging anything and encourage you to show everybody. Because I think it's a good movie. I think it's a good message. That being said, we just don't do it on our own. Um, we work in cohorts with our other chicken uh, producers here in the United States through the National Chicken Council. And who is the National Chicken Council? It's a trade association made up of the broader producers in the United States. And they have the welfare program. And the guidelines that the NCC put together is for the humane treatment of animals and to promote the production of quality products. You look at their five steps, their five points of uh, animal welfare, and again, these are probably worth reading. Um, and I think the most important one is to hear point three, but we'll read all five of them. Uh, the principles that NCC goes by, first off, that poultry raised for food should be cared for in ways that prevent or minimize fear, pain, stress, and suffering, some of the five freedoms that Kate was talking about. Second point, guidelines for welfare should balance science and professional judgment with consideration of ethics and societal values. Point three is the welfare of the chickens themselves. That's foremost, not how humans might perceive or practice our environment. Point four, poultry should be treated with respect all the way through, including their slaughter. And point five is it'll be uh, updated. And this version uh, just updated in February of this year. So every two years, NCC is asking, are we doing the right things the best way? And there's an audit that goes with this, and if you can see at the bottom here, there's the point system. There's five different uh, areas that are looked at. In the first two, you've got to get all of these points, and that's corporate commitment and training. You've got to have corporate commitment and training to even go past that. And then these other uh, varieties on, on grow out and catching and so forth. So NCC has a guideline that we abide by. But question, uh, important question is who's going to do the audit? You just don't want somebody to come in who doesn't know what they're talking about, so we want PACO certified auditors, and who are they? And I pulled these off the PACO website. Um, what is the mission of PACO? It's to train people how to assess the humane treatment of animals. And importantly, relying on those people that know it best, the allied groups. And if you look at those allied groups, this is a list of the allied groups, and I highlighted the chicken groups. They incorporate the veterinarians, the AAAP, uh, poultry Scientists and Poultry Science Association, and then the trade group NCC. Of course, there's other species involved, cows and pigs, but um, I think they're doing a good job of incorporating the professionals. And then this is Kate's bragging rights right here. Uh, the Paul score is updated in 2015. This is product of the veterinarians, now the AAAP. Real simple, you either pass or you fail. And what's it look like on broilers? Paul's that would pass and Paul's that would fail. And I think this is a good document, easily to train by. And that's what we want with PACO, is folks that know what they're talking about. So when we do our third-party audits, we want to go by NCC guidelines as much as possible, and we want to use PACO certified uh, auditors. Some of the things that we've tried, and there's a list of them, I'll show you a partial list. And we're going to hit on three big ones, or three that have been reported publicly. The first is gate scoring. Uh, this can came out of Europe. They, they use a Keston gate scoring system, seven-point system, a little bit cumbersome. So uh, Bruce Webster, University of Georgia, asked, is there a better way? And so we went to a three-point system and got that published, and we were part of that both with the University of Georgia and Mississippi State. And then we had also following Europeans' lights. Some of Kate's pictures showed bright lights. Are brighter lights better? It was a question we had one of our customers. And so we did some studies with that. And also it was artificial light or natural light, which is better. And I'll show you some brief summary on our findings on that. And then stress. How do you measure the well-being of an animal? They're not talking. So what objective measures can you use? And corticosterone is a measure. And we did some work with J. Paul Thaxton when he was still alive, 
looking at corticosterone, and I'll give you a quick uh, update on that. <coughs> and these are just some of the, the uh, uh, lead slides from particular talks. This was given by myself and the Mississippi uh, Med uh, Medical Association way back in 2005, but this is the first one we're doing the gait scoring. And what we found in our conclusions was, the first, the, the European system, or the American system, was easier to train people than the European system. Three points is easier to train than seven points. That's not a, too hard to fathom that. But we also found our U.S. numbers were lower on gait abnormalities than were reported by the Europeans. What, what's different? I mean, Kate's been there and knows the European system, but there's something different between the, their system and our system. And we found that we looked like our broilers were more mobile than the European uh, broilers. And on to the lights. What's a better light program? And I had to suffer. I had to go to Hawaii, AVMA that year, and talk about lights. And they had two, two brighter light programs they would look at, and we kept our dim-down program. And we, at the end, this is what we found. If you compare their two bright light uh, suggestions versus our dimmer light program, there really wasn't much difference in livability. Body weights were or, or larger, actually, on brighter uh, light. Fee conversion was worse. And as most production animals, you know, you increase fee conversion, you increase cost. So the brighter lights were actually less efficient. So if somebody wanted a brighter light chicken, they're going to have to eat or have to pay for that higher cost of feed. On the welfare component, we saw actually the gate scores are worse on bright lights. And maybe that's part of the European gate score <coughs> problem. Uh, when we had our dim lights, it was better. And in the corticosterone, we didn't get a stress response. But if you looked at uh, comparison, the dimmer lights tended to have a lower uh, steroid response than the brighter lights. And this is all notes from AVMA if you want them. And then another AVMA talk, this was up in Minnesota this time, looking at stress and broilers and trying to use an objective measure, which is corticosterone. And again, just in, in short, uh, we looked at natural light, we looked at reduced light, and we didn't induce stress even in a bright light or a dim light system. Uh, we didn't see a stress response even as the birds age. It got more shoulder to shoulder, which kind of makes sense. You know, the chickens are flock animals. They want to be with each other. The most stressful thing you can do to a chicken is take it off by himself. <clears throat> so we didn't see getting uh, more pounds per square foot as being a stressful event. And then, although not, not significant, it looked like uh, the reduced light had lower steroid responses than the brighter light. But none of the uh, levels we found were, were stressful events. And so, you look at this is some things that have been published. We've been a part of the scientific committee or community trying to improve animal welfare. Can we do things better? What are the animals saying? And this is, again, things we've said publicly. So this is not private. We've been a part of it. I guess we go back to communication. We've been talking to scientists. I mean, look at this big crowd in here, right? Who's listening to the story? It's a very small group. And we've been talking about it, but who's been listening? Apparently, we haven't had the right audience to influence a change. And that's evident, too, by some of the questions we get to answer now. And some of the hot topics that we just answered last week, what about slower growth poultry? And I think you've heard Kate uh, answer to some of that, and you'll hear some of the same things just now. Even if we wanted them, couldn't get them. All the primary breeders are doing a good job of getting more pounds on less feed each year. And you saw the trends from Kate's uh, slide. Uh, we don't want to back up technologically. So, and they're just not there. And that's not what's going to keep us in business is going to be uh, using more feed for less meat. That's just reverse of what we're trying to do. We can make smaller chickens, and an example of that is the Cornish. The Cornish bird is just a 28-day-old broiler. You grow them out to 49 days, it's in the tray pack. You grow them out to 63 days, it's a cut-up. It's the same breed, just or same hybrid, just at a different age. If you want a skinnier chicken, well, that's not natural. Skinnier chicken, you have to get different genetics. Go back to the non-selected lines, or the dual-purpose breeds, or we can get them on our current breeds. You just can't feed them, and that's not humane. So right now, slower growth poultry is not an answer for U.S. Uh, commercial broilers. What about reducing stocking density? I already talked about being a flock animal. You saw the video. You saw how the animals are spread out. They have uh, free range to go where they want to. Why do we establish the densities we do? And we talked about it in the, uh, in the, in the movie. There's two needs, the needs of the birds and the needs of the farmer. All of our farmers are family farmers. The Sanderson Farms owns the chickens, owns the feed. We don't own the farm. The farmer's got to pay the bill, the house note, the electric note, the water bill. 
they've got to be able to pay for it. You know, one bird per house, well, of course, they, the chicken wouldn't like that either. The, the farmer can't make a payment. So we've got to make a, enough space for the birds and, and enough birds in the, in the farm to pay for the bills. And we grow two sizes of chickens. In our bigger chickens, we have less, square, less birds per square foot, and that's very simple. You, you uh, put your placement based upon your needs of your market. And so if they want reduced density, that's fine. If we're going to grow a bigger chicken, we can say we're doing that, you know, reduced density with a bigger chicken. And then something we do that's kind of different is we have an extra feed line and extra water lines, which would allow us to have more birds with more access to feed than, say, some of the other uh, producers. Um, so what does a chicken really want, you know, and the feed and water is part of it. And that goes back to the next questions on enrichments. What about enrichments? And this is kind of something I made up, and it's probably, I don't know if it's heresy, or but um, taken off Maslow's you know, needs, the human needs. And what are and then the needs of a chicken? And that was also kind of based upon the five freedoms that came out of Europe. And I'm going to say in priority, now the five freedoms to my knowledge are not prioritized. But I think in terms of a chicken, and we see this with baby chicks, we see this with uh, older chickens, the first thing they need to be is freed from predation. You know, their biggest concern in the wild is being eaten by another species. Of course, we won't eat them, but uh, their fear, and it's still this today, you go into a chicken house and you put anything above their head, they, it's like a hawk. They, they run away from it. So they have a fear response um, that's uh, been inbred. So being free from predation is the first thing. The next thing is they need to be comfortable. And we see this cold baby chicks don't eat. You know, if you got to get them warm to even go to feed and water, they'll starve to death right next to water in, in uh feed if they're cold. So when you have thermal comfort next. The next need they have is to have food and water. And then finally, they get to go play. So on a chicken's mindset, what's the most important thing they need to not be eaten by another? The last thing on their mind is going to be, can they get to play? So what about enrichments? Like I said before, the red jungle fowl, he's trying to avoid the hawk. And all these Sanchez Farms chickens are inside of a house. They don't have to worry about predation. So they can really focus on eating and relaxing and just growing. So then what do uh, enrichments equate to? I think Kay kind of hit on this. They could be just considered obstacles. But again, what's a chicken want? And you're not asking what does a person want of a chicken? What's a chicken want? So, you know, hay bales and perches, they're, they're things to look at and make you feel good down the farm, but it's another place to get hung up on. It's another place where you break your leg. And then we talked about reduced light. And we showed that uh, dim light was better than natural light. And you start putting natural light back into the chicken houses. I don't know if you saw in the movie when the lights were brightened up on those broilers, there was a cockfight that went on. And we reduced the lights to keep the boys from fighting each other. The girls don't do that. The boys do. Okay, then on to what about gas stunning. And, again, chickens aren't turkeys. I think Molly did a good job of showing you some of the obstacles with uh, turkeys. We don't have the same obstacles in chickens. And we've looked at this. And we've looked at on a small scale in the back of our plant, I've got to go watch, it's ugly. The way we saw controlled atmosphere stunning, I'm sure we didn't go through all the tweaking that you all had to do. But what we saw was a lot of activity, a lot of aversive behavior to carbon dioxide. And then when they went down, they didn't go down quietly, they went down with the flutter. And when they fluttered, they broke themselves up. So meat quality was also affected, not just animal welfare. And you see the Europeans going to this, I think primarily because what they're comparing it to is a high-voltage stun versus a low-voltage stun. Uh, Bruce Wetzer has got some great videos showing the different responses to stun. An electrical stun, whether it's high-voltage or low-voltage, it's immediate. It's like a gunshot. It just goes through the, the birds insensible. Any type of gas stunning is staged. It takes minutes, not seconds, not milliseconds. It takes a time to put a bird down with gas. So in terms of speed, um, if you had a gas mirror or shoot me, I'd say shoot me. But... Um, that's anthropomorphizing chicken. I can't get to do that with the chicken. So we have not found in our uh, system that CES is better than what we currently have. Not to say we're against it. We just haven't found it yet. I think Molly had a good idea, too, is just the worker safety. You have on-farm CO2 system. That scares me. And you have CO2 systems in the back of a plant. That scares me. Because if you can kill a chicken, you can probably kill a person. And then the big one. How about getting rid of animal? How is that an animal welfare issue? Withholding treatment, really? And so we just we'll get on this on the whole antibiotic side. <clears throat> Ideally, we don't want to use antibiotics. Commercial producers don't want to give the pharmaceutical companies money. We're not that altruistic, and nobody wants to use antibiotics, whether they're a person or an animal. 
You know, unfortunately, bad things happen to good people and to good chickens, and you need them sometimes. That being said, compared to our European, or even compared to Mexico and Canada, we have very few antibiotic options. Folks north and south of us can use a whole lot more range of products than we can. So if we decline even one antibiotic, we've reduced our arsenal substantially. So if I'm going to say I'm not going to use Virginia Myosin because it's labeled as a humanly and medically important antibiotic, that's going to take away from me for the future use if I need it. What if, for instance, as it did happen in 2016, that Zoetis runs out of bacitracin? Where's your option? And so when you stop using a particular product, then you're declining even smaller, you're producing even a smaller arsenal. And I think as veterinarians, we'd be well tended to wisely use what we have and not forego those that we do have. And it's been, uh, since my time there at Sanderson Farms, all antibiotics have always been underneath direct supervision of me. So it's a small, you know, poultry, we, we run a lot of animals underneath one veterinarian. All antibiotic decisions have been made by me. So the VFD is nothing new. It's just the paperwork. I've always had that oversight, always had that input. So to say we're going to change our behavior based upon a new law, no. We've always done that. And I'm going to brag a little bit, but this board certification cost me quite a few years and gray hairs. I think we probably know what we're talking about. And when you take antibiotic decisions away from the veterinarians and give it to somebody else, then you're taking away from the most uh, educated folks on the, on the matter. And then it gets to be in the marketing ploy. Now, I understand veterinarians, none of our patients ever pay the bill. It's always the client. So you're going to do what your client wants to do. However, as veterinarians, if we can, given the, the freedom and authority to make our own decisions, we should for the betterment of the animal. And I think in terms of antibiotics, it's not a good idea for the animal. And I want to have that ability as a veterinarian to intervene when needed. So I guess I ran through these pretty quick, but um, I really think the video said most of what I wanted to say. And that's how we deal with chickens at Sanderson Farms, but we do work not just with ourselves, but also with the national groups. We've been key to answering some of those questions, and we're still answering questions.